welcome to the OS North webinar, Bite Size Marketing. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to remind everyone to put your phones on mute. Uh, you guys can do this by pressing star six on your telephone. Okay. It is with my pleasure to introduce the guest speaker for this webinar, Nancy Dowd. Nancy is the Director of Marketing and Public Relations at the New Jersey State Library. She is the co-author of the blog, The M Word, Marketing Libraries, and the book, Bite Size Marketing, Realistic Solutions for Overworked Librarians, which is now a bestseller with ALA. Without further delay, I will pass it on to Nancy. Thanks, Nicholas. Hi, everybody. Um, I thought what we would start with is a simple poll, just to get a sense for what everybody uh, who, who you are and what you do in terms of your library and marketing. So I'm just going to find my poll. Um, okay. So here's the first poll, and you can vote. Are you in your library, are you full-time, part-time, or is this just one of a million things you're doing? Eight, five, thirteen, fourteen. All right. Well, so I'm going to share these. Did everyone get to vote? I'll give you just about a minute more. I think we've got everybody. I'm going to share these results. It looks like we've got some overworked librarians here. All right. And I think can can everyone see the um, the results of the poll? You can just put in a chat. Somebody can say that yes, you see it or. No. No? Hmm. I'm not getting any chat, Nicholas. So just so that you know, on the poll, five of you said that you're full-time, one is a part-time, and eight of you are doing a million things, and this is just one part of it. Nancy, they're, they're seeing the uh, results. Oh, good. Okay. Perfect. So with that said, the thing about marketing that we all know, we know what marketing is. The problem is most people in libraries just don't have the time to do it. And that's what bite-sized marketing is really all about. So the first thing that we, we try to stress is that marketing above anything else is simply conversations. It's finding out what people are interested in and what they need. How many of you, now over in the chat, feel free when I ask a question that you can put into your all and you can chat over on the right-hand side. How many of you remember the fiasco that happened with Gap last year? They wanted to run a new logo. And this is the, this is the logo they came up with. The problem was nowadays with Twitter and Facebook, there was this huge firestorm of negative reaction because they never checked with their customers to see whether or not that brand would work with them. So worse, then the Gap people decided, oh my gosh, we, we goofed up, we're going to crowdsource this because they really have no idea what social media is. So they, all of a sudden they're ready to crowdsource their logo, which of course isn't going to work. And finally, they finally said, okay, we're really goofing up. We're just going to stay with the old logo. And one of the lessons that I think everybody learned from that is that we need, we need places, even the strongest of brands, we have to listen to our audience, and we need communities to have those conversations. So right there, the strength of our libraries is that we do have communities. The question is, how do we communicate? So I'll stay here. So I'm going to give you, please select the all. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you another poll because I'd like for you to share how, what are your favorite ways of communicating out to your customers? And I get this one. Now, face-to-face, -face, most of you, if you're in a small library, face-to-face -face is incredible. 
but are you using any kind of social media such as Facebook or Twitter? Are you using an online newsletter, blog, email? What is it that you're using? Oh, a lot of Facebook. Oh, well, one Facebook. Go ahead, and you can pick your favorite. Unfortunately, this polling, we couldn't pick two. So if you, if you have, um, if you're using several different types of um, tools, you can put that in your chat. Um, okay, Diane wants to know what crowdsourcing is. Crowdsourcing is when you put out a question to a group and you let the group come up with a decision. So in the case of um, if, if we wanted to do some crowdsourcing from your library and you had a Facebook page, when, when the state library wanted to do a marketing campaign, we had come up with three or four different designs. So what we did was we put that out to our librarians. We showed them the designs on our blog. And then we let them give us feedback, which ones we gave them a poll of what they could vote for. And then we also let them give us feedback on what they thought of that. And so we really let the crowd give us the feedback and tell us what, what would work and what wouldn't. All right, so it looks like eight of you are using Facebook. Three are using newsletters, one's blogging, and four are still using email, which is great. So I'm going to share this with you. And this gives you an idea of what you're doing amongst yourself. I have a hand raised. Um, Beverly, I noticed that your hand was raised. I'm going to lower your hand, but if you have a question, please feel free to put it into the uh, chat room. All right. So the next thing that we talk about in Bite Size really is about marketing is also advocacy. And this is huge for us because libraries never really had to do advocacy, but we know what is the problem is that we're being funded by the government and the government has no money. This, this quote I thought was really interesting because in Philadelphia when they lost their funding, even their supporters could, they were very tolerant in losing money because they thought, gee, the government doesn't have money and Gee, the, gov the, the mayor is doing the best he can. So when we start to talk about marketing and we talk about the products that we put out for our customers, we have to remember that we have to keep letting people know that our libraries are essential, that we can't not be funded. This is down in uh, D.C. and the question was, are libraries on borrowed time? People are actually having this debate. Are libraries even valuable? Do we need them? So when we start to do marketing and we market all of our products, whether we're doing something for job seekers or reading for kids, we have to always bring back the point that this is why we are essential. Now, of course, the other problem is what about non-users? Here in the States, we have a whole lot of people who are running government who don't use our library, and we have a lot of people in our towns that don't use libraries. So when we start to talk about our programs and marketing, we also have to look at, well, how does a non-user view libraries? And if we are not able to communicate out our essential use, then chances are libraries more and more are going to close. And that's that's happening in the states that we're being threatened. And up in Canada, I think you guys are also having some financial problems, right? So marketing equals image. And for those of you who have a large department and you're working full time, you may, um, if you're full time marketers, and even those of you who are part time or doing a million different things, your library may not be investing in, in image or your brand. So one of the things we like to talk about is your basics, your logo, your colors, fonts, style guides. And in Bite Size Marketing, we're saying that even if your library isn't branding, you can. If you have a department, you can pick your colors and just stick with your colors. 
Make sure your logo is on everything. It's as simple as that. Look at your style guide, which is essentially just looking at your colors, your fonts that you're using. Are they consistent? If you put all your flyers together that you're putting out, do they look like they're coming from the same source? Your brand is how people see you. The most important part of your, your brand is that the programs that you're putting on, how you say it. How many times have you seen people in libraries put up these handwritten signs or little, little signs that say, oh, don't do this and don't do that or don't use a telephone or here are five cent fines here and they clutter up the desk with tons of little signage. That's branding your library, if you can believe it or not. Even though you're not intentionally branding it, that's the brand that someone comes in and sees. I love Barnes & Noble and because they teach us a lot, because they have very similar products as we do. Now, when you look at this page, this is an old page of theirs, and the first thing you notice is, what is it that they're selling? All right, they're selling books. Books are here, they're selling gift cards. But when they went to the next, when they updated it, what were they suddenly selling? Sure enough, there's the Nook and their membership. Books are still down at the bottom, but they're emphasizing what is important to them. When the New York Public Library redesigned their website, they came over and they were Discover, Connect, and Inspire. And here were the three things that they felt were most important for their library. So when you start to brand your library, it doesn't have to be this huge process. You can really just take, take the top three things that you think about your library is representing. Is it fun, books, research, information, preservation? Just pick three. If you're working in a department, if you're a children's librarian or a teen librarian or a reference librarian, what are the top two things that would describe your department? Are you fun? Are you serious? Are you about learning? And this is, this is, it's just this simple. What do you want your customers to know about you? Your library is about learning or fun or whatever it is. So the message that we try to give you is that branding is really simple. It can be bigger, but you can also keep it very simple. Branding by default, remember when I talked about the signs on, on the desk? There's also, if you, don't defend your, if you don't define who you are, you will be defined anyway. I don't know how many of you remember Sex in the City. But this scene with Carrie talking to Mr. Big, and she has a library book in her hand, right here. And she's saying, he says to her, wow, you must be the only person in New York City who still uses a library book. And she says, no. And she puts the book up to his nose, and he says, ooh, that's an oldie. Now, that just breaks your heart because that is branding by default. Unless you are contradicting, unless you are clearly defining what you are, this kind of talk and image in, in the movies and newspapers will define who you are. So the other thing that is really important is that marketing is knowing your customers. In the old days, and many libraries still are, are using what is called a push. We come up with the ideas. We decide what the library is going to do. And we create a program, and then we create flyers, and we try to convince people to come to, to use us. But in reality, the best way to, to work our programs anymore is by really letting our customers tell us what they need. Here in Princeton, in New Jersey, Albert Einstein worked at Princeton University, and the town is pretty well known for Albert Einstein. One of our community members found out that there's a huge celebration called Pi Day, which happens to be Albert Einstein's birthday.
but Princeton had no celebration. So this woman ran a walking tour in the town and went to the library and said, hey, you know what, let's do something to celebrate the birthday. And sure enough, the library got on board and said, we can do some programs. And really, they let this person who started the whole idea engage the entire town. She had all the merchants involved. They had an Albert Einstein lookalike contest. They had a pie counting where people recited what the pie, to see how far the number pie could go. And as far as the lookalikes, they even had kids involved in the lookalike. The entire town was all involved in this. And now it is actually a three, considered a three-day weekend in Princeton. They're actually promoting this as a tourist attraction. And it was effective not because the library decided to do it, but because someone outside the library decided to come to them and ask them to do it. It's knowing your community. Whether or not your community is into knitting or cars or whatever it is, it's up to us to know what is the community doing. And a lot of that just means following our news. In the States, bullying became a huge problem. So what happened is libraries started to create programs based on helping parents with bullying, job seeking. Now, I know Canada's also experiencing some unemployment problems. So same here in the States. We're responding by doing job seeking. And of course, marketing is creating the experience. Now, many of you might know Doc over in the Netherlands. What they have is they, they have this incredible library, and it's not really huge, but it's creative and it's innovative. And when you walk in, they have this wall now that people can come and tell their story. And it connects to the neighborhood and goes street by street so that if you live on a certain main street, you can see all the different stories from the people, and it's creating community. But what makes DOC such an exciting library is that every time you go into that library, there's a wonderful experience waiting for you. And the thing about a great experience is that people will share this. I picked this blog because this woman is actually on her blog bragging about her library and getting her friends involved. And that's the whole idea behind marketing is if we create an exciting enough experience, other people are going to talk about it. Marketing is partnerships. Remember when I talked about Princeton? I think one of the things that we found with Bite Sized is that so many libraries are working so hard and they're always trying to get people involved in what their programs are. Instead of doing that, by looking at the community and thinking, well, how can we partner? How can we help that group succeed? Creates a partnership opportunity. What we did here, this is our first lady, Mary Pat Christie, and this is the owner of the Devils uh, hockey team, and this is Zach Parisi. And what happened is we asked Zach to be a library champion because he loves reading and he loves libraries, and he did. And we actually got the Devils and the First Lady to come for a story hour to, to help promote reading. And from there, that partnership just spread throughout New Jersey with the First Lady really helping to promote reading and the Devils getting on board. One of the things that libraries are discovering, too, is that there's a lot of people who are, hang who are taking that low-hanging fruit. But the real trick is finding the gaps and filling them. Where are the problems? What is not being handled in your community? The outspoken library is something that we came up with here in New Jersey. The, we ha have a library called the Talking Book and Braille Center, which is for deaf it is for people who cannot read either because of a visual or a physical handicap. And what we found out is that in our public libraries, boomers are aging out, but they were, never had a disability, so they never think of going to the Talking Book and Braille Center. So what we did was we created this outspoken library, and we put kiosks in our public library so that as people get older and they have 
physical or visual handicaps, they can actually go right to the kiosk and sign up to be a member of this Talking Book and Braille Center. They get a reading machine, and it's just a natural progression. But it, we did it in public libraries because that's where our customers are. The other piece is, this is a new campaign that we're doing. It's called, uh, it's built for job seekers, and we received a grant. We're, we're conducting 800 workshops across the state of New Jersey in libraries. Community colleges are conducting these for job seekers. We've got the online resources. We're helping people uh, build their resumes. And these are all the things that I'm sure you're doing in Canada as well, only we're packaging it and we're marketing it with it's time for a new start. And everywhere you go in New Jersey, that's our, that's our new mantra. It's time for a new start. You, we're not, we're not going to let you be depressed. It's time to get that job. It's time for a new start. And your New Jersey library is going to help you. So. One of the things I wanted to finish this talk up with before we take questions is about David Carroll. And I don't know how many of you have heard his story. Uh, David Merrill talked about him in his, latest, not in his latest book. But David Carroll is a guitar player, and he was riding on United Airlines, and his guitar was wrecked. And no matter what he did, United Airlines wouldn't respond. And so finally, he decided to write a song about it. And he put it up on YouTube, and it ended up getting millions of hits. Well, United Airlines still didn't respond. That's when Taylor Qatar, who happens to be the Qatar that got wrecked, they actually went up on YouTube, and they, they created a video showing people how, how they can help you Fix your guitar, that this happens all the time, and with Taylor, we, we back our guarantee. And then, all along the, the way, there's a guitar case maker who contacts David and says, hey, you know what? We have a guitar case that we think will withstand any kind of abuse, and we would like to call it the David Carroll guitar case, which David said, he tested it out, and he goes, yeah, this works. And they made the guitar case, and United Airlines finally apologized. But through all of this, the real story behind this is the idea that a guitar case manufacturer looked at an opportunity and said, you know what, we can really help to solve a problem. Taylor Guitar did the same thing. So when we, as libraries, we start to look at how we're going to market ourselves, we can say, how can we be that guitar case maker? How can we find the gap and fill it? You can reach me at, of course, my blog, blog and you can Twitter and Facebook me. I hope that you will all friend me. Um, I'm open for questions. And under the chat, would any, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Can no. I ask a question verbally? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Okay, I'm not that great at typing there. I'm, I'm a trustee on a small library board, a fairly new trustee, mm -hmm. and in a very rural area with a very small population. And I find that um, the library competes a lot. Um, people are rural, so they don't want to go in town unless they have to. We're in the north. The weather's bad. It's very hard to compete with other activities locally. Is there anything specific about marketing in, in small rural areas? Because um, we don't have the same communication levels as large cities, nor the population numbers. So when, they, when you're saying that they're competing with the other activities, one of the things that we find is this whole partnership concept where, like, for example, in New Jersey, sports for kids is huge. This is what kids do on their weekends. And so the idea is to partner with the youth athletics group to promote your library services. So in your case, if you look at those other activities, how is there any crossover between what you could offer and what they're doing? 
you know, whether, whether that's a program that you're going to partner on or whether it's actually setting up something where you can bring books and people can check out books or tapes or information right there at those activities. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's like fair, local fairs and things like that, yeah. Well, it, it's not even so much a local fair. In other words, tell me, tell me an activity that they would be doing. Um, here, it's basically we have agricultural fairs or winter carnivals. Um, other than that, there would be the children's sports and local legion. So, so with the children's sports, imagine if you spoke with the – and I'm assuming there's some hockey in there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine if you spoke with the local hockey team and you said to them, listen, what if we set up a table – in, in the arena here with books, and we could sign up people for uh, library cards here so that you're kind of doing an outpost for your library, and you start to engage people in that process. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. And, and then you can take that a step further because you probably have some online resources, right? Yes. So for the online resources, that's where you grab the parents and you're saying to them, hey, we know you're swamped with time and we know you need homework help. This is what we can offer you online. So you can start to educate the parents of what they can do to help their kids succeed at school. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Getting to know our audience, what would be some of the questions we ask? I'm assuming this is by way of a questionnaire. All right. So in the book, we do some really simple questions uh, to ask your audience. And depending on the, the most important thing that we're finding is you've got to narrow down your audience. So, for example, when we start to talk about um, – Kids. It's not just kids. It's a certain age. It's a certain group of people. And then from there, we're going to ask our questions. So in a case, like for example, with our hockey team, how old are those kids? What are they doing in school? Are we going to bring that all the way up to high school? Are we looking at college? Um, are kids trying to get into college? Are they writing essays? Once you start to target what your group is, then you start to ask those simple questions about what are you interested in, what do you wish that you could find or do that was easier? Because remember, you're asking for gaps. How many of you are, are feel like you're filling in gaps for services in your, in your libraries? Uh, while you think about that, Gwen um, asked, would an online survey be a good idea, going to the arena or schools? Online sur surveys are good. The only problem is they're not always highly, they're not, people don't always respond to them as well. If you target it to a certain place on your website that in response to them using their website, it might work well. But I'm going to say go to the arena and go to the schools and actually talk face to face and you're going to get a much better response. Are any of you working with helping job seekers find jobs, get online, fill out resumes, online applications? Is that going on up there at all? Um, Irene Moore from Terrace Bay, Ontario. I'm northwestern Ontario. We have been Oh, economically depressed for some time, and our the one one employer has just gone back. Oh no! Oh yes, we were about 20 months without there being an employer in in the community. So we know, for example, that our library was kind of the place for people to go for resumes to fill out their unemployment insurance. We are a, an access point for Service Ontario as well. So the library became uh, the number of people coming into the library increased. Right. 
And so what we have tried to do is to maintain that. We've just moved into a brand new facility and we're finding people are curious now about the new facility. So we're actively trying to get people to continue to come in. But again, we're faced with some of the same issues in terms of marketing. We have no money to market, so your suggestion to go out there into the community is probably the best one. We've kind of thought we've sent our poor CEO into a local bakery and places like that where she can hand out out things to people. Right, right. So, Irene, are you also taking names in a way that you can communicate back to people, such as email? Are people on email? Well, yes, but that's the other, the demographic in our community is such that we are an aging population, and so many do not use the Internet at all. So we pretty much, we've got a, a student that we hire every year to the community access program, and we are attempting to educate people that way. I mean, I'm an old lady, but I use the Internet, and I use everything. <laughs> it's probably because I was a school teacher before, so I kind of had to do it. Right. And so I think that's what's happened here is that the demographic is such that very few people are actively know anything about the Internet. So one of the things that comes to mind with that is that if you get two or three or four seniors that you have brought over to using the Internet, and chances are they're using it for the pictures for the grandkids, they can be in contact with family, that kind of thing, then what I would do is then I would enlist them to start going out into the community and spreading the word because they're going to be far more powerful in, in terms of connecting to their friends and convincing people that this is a great program. So, and, and, and they're going to be excited about their new services. So think in those terms, too, like, all right, so if we get – two or three or four people that are doing this, how can we get the, share their excitement in the community? Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful idea. I mean, we have it, we've just done it with the genealogic, genealogical workshops that we've had. That seems to be a big one, and that has brought in many, many people. Oh, yes. That sort of thing. And I know through Ontario Library Service North, they offered some free, free services as well. So we've been able to train somebody, and our library is now – attached to the um, Seniors Activity Center. Excellent. So we do, you know, wander down there all of the time with what our services are and that kind of thing. And that they, we have a coffee pot that they like our coffee better than they like in the Senior <laughs> Center. So that brings them back to our library. But it's sort of like I don't know whether we're making a, a connection that is sort of a lasting one or if it's just the novelty of the new building. Right. Well, I think that's where your experience comes in, that if you are really creating something that of interest and that is an experience, they will come back. But also, one of the things that came to mind as you were talking about your seniors is what may even be a fun campaign is, you know how they always have the mentors where they have the kids teaching the seniors how to use email? Yes. What if we switch that around? What if we did a workshop where we had a few seniors teaching kids how to do email or something on the computer, which kind of like shakes up that idea of what a senior is, even if it just got you a picture in the paper and a short article that may be a connection, again, to seniors with that, boy, you know, I, I didn't think of ourselves as that way. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, so that may be a fun idea as well. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important with this new facility is that you're constantly asking people what would they envision being here, what would they like, what would they attend, okay. because you're going to let them create that experience. And that's sort of what, as a board, we've set that particular goal. We're going to, each board member, we're a small board, there are only five of us on the board, but we're going to go out to various um, communities, like area, um, like the, the businesses and that thing, and show them a little bit about what the library is about and how can we work with them. Right. So we're going to attend, you know, one of their meetings, sort of thing, get ourselves on the agenda. That way they get to know who the board members are, and at the same time we can introduce the facilities. But, And that's kind of that little advocacy plan that we've, we're just working, starting to work, it, work on it. So. Yeah, it sounds excellent. Sounds excellent. 
Say, uh, connect me onto my Facebook and keep me up with what goes on with that. Okay. Okay. Um, we're at 46, 59 minutes, I think, 45 minutes. Um, any more questions? Nicholas, how are we doing? We're doing good. We still have a few more minutes if other people have questions. I, it's Irene again. I never did get on, so that's why I'm talking rather than typing. Oh, okay. No, and please feel free to talk. We're a small group. Talking's great. <laughs> Anybody else that wants to ask a question, please feel free to talk. I, I have a question. It's Irene again. She's a busy, busy person here. But when you talked about branding the library right at the very start, you suggested using, like, your logo having a tagline, using uh, the same type of font. Right. Um, how do you go about choosing the font that's right for you? Well, you know what? <laughs> okay, in bite size, this is our approach to this was just pick it. It okay. doesn't matter. Pick okay. one that's got um, sans serif and one that's serif and just use them over and over again. The reason why I say that is if you're not going to go through a huge branding process, it doesn't matter. You could put, pick Ariel and Garamond. Right. And just, but the trick is, is to use them enough times over and over again that it looks like your library. Okay. And the other piece of that, of course, is especially if you're working with seniors, Ariel works great for seniors. Yeah, I like that one. And Verdana is the other one that I like because... Yeah. It's good and clear and easy to read. Exactly. And actually, we had a designer pick Verdana for us, and that's what we use all the time. I think the big thing is colors. Pick, okay. pick, use your colors over and over again. Okay. Um, just keep it really simple but consistent. All right. And I, ours is easy because the town is just rebranding, and so we have kind of just gone along with it. We're kind of going to, because we're right on Lake Superior, so blue, rocks, water, that kind of thing is the image that the municipality is going with, and so we as a library, have, we're branding ourselves right along with them. So Right, right. And, you know, again, I have to stress that the branding is essential, but that branding has to follow through when people walk through your door. And you have a new facility. But for those of you who don't have new facilities, you know, the first thing I do is I look at a door that you're going to open. If that is plastered with signs that, you know, that million different signs of, um, you know, we're closed on Monday, we're, we're, we're open on this holiday, forget all that. Take that all down. The only thing that should be on a door when you walk into a library is welcome. Okay. That's a good idea. I, I never liked anything on, on doors. I, I kind of like it clean. Right, right. And the same, the same with the checkout. Oh, and also, if we're going to talk about branding, and we're talking about branding of what we look like in a library, if it stays consistent. I just did a, a talk for directors here in New Jersey and was pointing out that, you know, what we look like conveys so much more. So if we want to break the stereotype of what a librarian looks like, you have to look different. Okay. Good. I was sort of on the right track, but I just sort of, it's kind of good to talk to people who actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> well, it sounds like you, you pretty much know, Irene. No, well, I'm on another, on a marketing uh, um with the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries, so I've learned a little bit there. The learning curve has been huge, but it's right. sort of now to put it into practice. You know, you've got the theory in place, now it's the practice. Right, right, and that's really, that's, that's what we talk about in Bite Size. It's all the, it's the practice. Diane, are you trying to give a question? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, at, the, at the Powassan Library, we have a great, uh, what I thought was a great uh, introductory web page, but um, after listening to you, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe it's not. Basically, what we've done is we've splattered our first page with every logo, like, you know, if it's interlibrary loans, if it's a job bank, if it's a local newspaper, we've put kind of the link with the logo on 
of everything on the front page. And I'm just after listening to you saying pick three things, I'm wondering if that might be an overkill because I, I think we thought it might be easy for people to see, look at all we offer. Right. Well, I'd have to look at your website, but if you want to go that approach, which you can do, then what I would recommend is that you look at something like CNN or the newspaper sites, okay. categorize it, and keep it simple links. Okay. Uh, the problem with putting logos up is that people have to know what those logos are and translate that. Oh, yeah. So if they know what that is, that's okay too. But take a look at your newspaper sites, um, and you'll you'll see what really works. There's small fonts, lots of links, categories. So you can do that because I think I think when when I see that. It always makes me think that librarians, libraries want to make sure that you can access the information without having to dig deep. Is that was that your thinking? Exactly. Um, th that's exactly it. Like it's all there, but it's also to kind of say, hey, we're not just books, you know. Right. So if you looked at that website and it wasn't your library, would you? How would you describe it? Would it be that would be your brand? Right. So yeah. if it looks like if it looks like CNN then I would say, wow, it looks like this is a library that looks like it means about business and news. If it looks like, I'd have to, uh, and if you, if you type in your um, website, I'll make sure I go after we get done with the meeting. And then I, if you give me your email, I can e email you back on, on what I'm thinking. But without seeing it, it's hard for me to say. Yeah, okay, that's good. Thank you. How many of you on your websites are marketing to parents? Here in the States, we have, if you go to a library website, we always have something for kids, always have something for teens, but we very seldom have things for parents, and that's a huge target audience. I don't think our website does that. I think it just sort of targets uh, all all clients and then has little subcategories for teenagers. Right. And I think now we, with our new database, there's one called Tumble Books that sort of markets for the younger reader as well. But I, I don't think that we actually target different people. Right. How I always think of it is, if I read the newspaper and there's something of relevance to me, I want to go to my library and I want to be able to get that information easily. So if it's something like unemployment or or um, disaster preparedness, that's easy enough to find. But what if there is something that my lifestyle, you know, I just celebrated a birthday and I don't want to tell you how old I am. Not that old, but uh, I'm baby boomer for sure. But I would love, I just saw this um, thing for over 50 people. I would like to be able to go to a website and see exercise for over 50. So if you think in, in target audiences, you start to, to have a different feel for your web. Not to say that you're going to be able to do 50 above, but if you target, if you pick a group. So, Nicholas, I think that's about it. If we don't have any other questions, I would like to thank Nancy for her wonderful presentation. I know we've learned a lot, and I bet you've learned some new skills as well. Um, I'd just like to throw a little plug in there that if any libraries are interested in any branding or marketing plans or any kind of that help, uh, OLS North provides that service free of charge, so you can send us an email at marketing at OSN.ca and we'd be more than happy to help you. So thanks again, Nancy. It was, uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you. And Nicholas, what a wonderful service. Your, your members should be very fortunate, count themselves very fortunate that you offer that. We are. Thank you. Okay, thank you.